series tonight. I want to talk, you know, we launched it out of 2 Corinthians 3.18. Then we haven't been back to that particular verse yet. But I want to get into it tonight and talk about it for a little bit. But what I want to do is start by reading chapter 3 and chapter 4 in their context, in their entirety. Chapter 3 and chapter 4. So let's grab them and you guys uh, follow along with us. Okay, now I'm reading out of the NASB. Um, so it doesn't matter what translation you want to read out of, but I like this one for this particular text tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now just hold your finger right there. I'm going to go to Psalms 51 because I want to, I want to help you. I want to show you a correlation here between some, some insight that the psalmist had. Uh, this was David in this particular psalm. And I believe that the man was a New Covenant guy living in the Old Covenant. And uh, he had some understanding of the heart of God, reg re relating to the heart of God and God's love for us. And in this particular chapter, he had just been exposed uh, because of his sin with Bathsheba and uh, having her husband murdered. So he's the king of a nation. He, got, he tripped and uh, was in a horrible uh, situation, and God judged him for it sent the prophet Nathan to uh, rebuke him for it, to deal with him for it. And so here in this, I, is that, do I just keep talking? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know what's going you didn't on. touch it? I'm not even touching anything. Oh, okay. And uh, this is him, this is in his response. This is David in his response uh, to the dealings of the Lord, okay? And let's just all stay focused, and I'll, I'll stay focused. I'll just hold the mic here whether it's doing anything or not. It might come back on in a minute. But I don't want you to get distracted and robbed out of a good opportunity because of the sound system tonight, okay? Amen. 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 This is David, okay? Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Amen. Now that echoes sentiments from Ephesians chapter 2 and 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Amen. Amen. Uh, so David had a revelation of God's great love for us and his desire to deal with us in accordance with his great love for us. Not the sacrifices, okay, that had been taking place up to this point in time here. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, these are all concepts that didn't exist in the Old Covenant, in that Old Covenant system. So he's praying a prayer to God based on the compassion of God. He's pulling on God's compassion, on God's love, on God's mercy, and he's saying, cleanse me from my sins, okay? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I have sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Uh, some people believe that's a reference, that about some of the Reformational fathers believe that was a reference to, to original sin, that all men are born into sin. I don't really think that that's what this particular verse is about. I'm not going to tackle that uh, belief system tonight. But this is because David, it's, it's widely believed by most theologians that he was a child of adultery himself. And so, in sin, my mother conceived me, uh, if that, it makes sense, if you think about it that way. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. You desire truth in the innermost being. The verses we just read in 2 Corinthians 3 are talking about how he's not writing on tablets of stone in the New Covenant, but on hearts. Man. Not stone, but hearts, flesh, okay? And we'll get deeper into that in just a second. I just wanted to show you this rich parallel out of, out of the book of Psalms. So you desire truth in the innermost being, not on stone, but inside, inside every one of us. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And here's another reference to new covenant life. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. 
and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltlessness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Okay, so let's just stop right there and pick back up where we were. I just wanted you to see that parallel to help you understand. I believe it helps you understand what we're about to read now. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, and he's referencing the old covenant here, uh, different translations say the ministry of condemnation the ministry of or the ministry of death, uh, it, it, in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech, and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. Somebody say their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Spirit, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> Last time I spoke on that was two weeks ago, and I was talking about the transition from glory to glory, and where you're at is glorious, where you're going is more glorious, but celebrate the glory where you're at and what God's doing in your life right now. Don't let yourself get frustrated because you're not there yet or because you haven't arrived at a point in the place you want to, but just look at what God's doing in you right now and recognize glory. See the glory that's there right now. So you can pick that up if you want to uh, refresh yourself on that, or some of you might have missed it. Uh, now we're going to go right into 2 Corinthians 4, because it begins with the therefore. So it's making a, it's a conjunction tying it together. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we, having renounced the hidden things, because the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. Say conscience with me. Conscience. Okay, so we talked about the mind a while ago. Now we're talking about the conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. Okay, look, skip down for the sake of time to verse 16 and let's finish that chapter up. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our out, outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For these momentary light afflictions 
is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So I wanted to just get back into this tonight and talk with you for just a little bit about what, the, what I perceive, what I believe to be the greatest hindrance to you seeing yourself in the image and likeness of God. The greatest hindrance that you have and I have to seeing ourselves uh, as glorious when we look in the mirror. Uh, it's one thing to look in the mirror of the Word, and when you have the veil out of the way, you look at the Word and you see Jesus Christ. And you see him in the Old Testament, you see him in the New Testament. There was a reference to our minds being blinded by the God of this world. And I want to talk about that, the God or the God of this age, God of this world, different translations say it different. But what I want to talk to you about is really what was moved off of you at the unveiling of the new covenant and who the God of this world is. Whenever I hear people say that Satan is the God of this world, I'm going to be honest with you, it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck because I don't believe it's proper exegesis of Scripture. I don't believe he's the God of anything. Amen. The only two, the only men that he sees in the earth is Adam or Christ, and we're in Christ now. Uh, Adam was the one who was given dominion and power. In Psalm chapter 8, uh, he's, he's, in Psalm chapter 8, he's saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man? You know, and he goes on to say a few verses down, You've made him just a, lower, a little lower than the Godhead, uh, or God. Some people say, Well, no, my translation says the angels, but that's not an accurate translation. The word there in the Hebrew is Elohim, it's God. It's the Hebrew word for God. So what the Bible is saying there in Psalm chapter 8 is you have made man in your image, in your likeness, just a little lower than God himself, and then you have given him dominion over all the works of your hands. You say, yeah, but Pastor Mark, Adam gave it to the devil. But I want to tell you something, that even if he did, even if you take that line of thought and that approach, if he lost it to the devil... Jesus has gotten it back. Amen. What the first Adam messed up, the last Adam corrected. He he's not going to one day. He already has. Amen. So he came. He could not seat, be seated right now if were he not finished. Amen. He said it is finished. He took a seat. He became the Father's right-hand man. That's really what being seated at the right hand of God means that you have now. It's a Hebrew phrase is what it is. It doesn't mean that God is always sitting right beside the Father. What it really means is that Jesus, through his obedience, became the Father's right-hand man. Amen. And now Ephesians says that we've been raised to see and seated in heavenly places with him. So guess what that makes us? The Father's right-hand men and, men and women. Amen? Amen? So we've been restored. So what the first Adam did lose, the second Adam, or the last Adam, rather, was it restored it. He set it all back right. He Amen. said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I don't believe the enemy, I don't believe that the accuser of the brethren has access to the throne of God anymore. Amen. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. The only place that the accuser has access to is your mind, which is still a high place. And so that's why the, 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 the Bible is full of references in the New Covenant to your mind and your conscience and purging your conscience from dead works and sprinkling the blood of Jesus on your conscience uh, and renewing your mind and being renewed in the spirit of your mind. All of the references that I just read to you uh, and many, many more. And I'm not talking about the renewing of the mind tonight or that's what we would look at. But I believe that where the fall took place was in the mind of man. Amen. That's what happened. They were naked and not ashamed, tending the work of the Lord in the garden. When they did what they did and they ate of the tree, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil... All of a sudden, something shifted. It wasn't that they fell out of heaven to earth where they were mentally at. They were mentally in the same place as God. So their perception was seeing the earth like God saw the earth, seeing themselves like God saw them. Where they fell was in their perception, their mind. Immediately, something shifted in their mind. And instead of seeing things here with God's perspective, they start seeing things here with a fallen mind. And the fallen mind could not conceive the will of God anymore, the purpose of God, couldn't see ourselves. So shame was the immediate result 
in Adam and Eve's life. Shame entered in immediately, and they hid themselves from God because of the overwhelming shame. Now, you know, and shame came from guilt, right? Man. What still plagues Christians today, believers today, and really humanity, is guilt and shame. Man. Guilt and shame continues to be the thing that causes us to run the other direction from anything that sounds or looks like God. Uh, you know, people run from relationship with Him. They run from commitment to Him because they're ashamed of the guilt. They're ashamed of different things in their life. So that's really the heart of it. But what Christ did was restored everything as the last Adam. And that means there's not another one coming. And none of us can mess this up now. Amen. Because He was the last one to come from the Father. So, so we're in Him now. We're the he was the firstborn among many brethren. We're the many brethren. Amen? Amen. We're the many brothers and sisters. So now we are meditating on what He did right. Amen? Uh, so the God of this age, I hear people say, well, the enemy is the God of this world, and he's the God of this age. Well, I don't like to take things out of context. Man. I grew up in circles where we didn't mind it so much, and we loved the Lord, but we just thought if you talked in tongues, you were spiritual, huh. and that was really all there was to it. And we thought we were the most spiritual bunch of believers out there because we spoke in tongues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the other denominations that didn't, they just didn't get it yet. But bless their little hearts, one of these days, God will open their eyes and they'll wise up and they'll speak in tongues too. Uh, I've done a lot of growing since then. Uh, but anyway, uh, the God of this age was something we had, we just grew up hearing people talk about, he's the God of this age and he controls everything here. But one day Jesus is going to come and set it back right. But I've got new news for you. That's not gospel. The gospel was an announcement that the Son of God came and already set everything right. Yes. It's not, the, the gospel is not good advice, it's good news. And for it to be good news, it has to be about something that has already happened. And yes, there are continuing ramifications from what has already happened. There will be an increase of His kingdom in the earth until this earth really looks like heaven. Okay? Man. But that, so that is a, that's a work in progress that is ongoing, but he came and set everything right. God became king. Jesus came and restored everything. So I, if you're tripped up right now that I said the God of this age is not the enemy, is not the devil, let's look at it in context. Can we rip through here together? Amen. Sure. Okay. It's a misquoted verse, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. And listen, in a generic sense, I think that it's true to say that the unbelievers are blind to the gospel. And, and, and sure, we could go ahead and say the devil deserves some of that blame. I really have a problem blaming him for anything, though. But it's just that my knowledge level has increased. My, my walk with God has increased, and I've studied now. I've walked in enough light to see that he can't stop any of us. Amen. And he's already been defeated. Amen. And Christ is in us. Greater is he that's in us than that's in the world. I mean, I could go on and on and talk about how he's not the problem anymore. Amen. The problem is our mind, we don't think right. Amen. And so we have to think right. So <clears throat> I think when we exegete 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 together, you're going to uh, arrive at the conclusion that I arrived at a few years back that he's not talking about the devil, okay? Amen. So... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me just bring out some contrasts. I read through them both real quick. Now what I want to do is go back and contrast some things, okay? Um, the section of the letter begins with contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And I've taught on this before. The Old Covenant is not the Old Testament, okay? In the Old Testament of your Bible, there are a lot of books there. The Old Covenant was the covenant given to Moses on Sinai. That's what I'm referencing there, okay? And so, the, oh, let's talk about Old Covenant realities versus New Covenant realities. And the Old Covenant was uh, written with ink or written on tablets. The New Covenant is written by the Spirit. There you have tablets of stone. Here you have tablets of human hearts. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6 says the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Yeah. All of this, I'm just going to go through here and par parallel a few things. Uh, because I'm not going to make an assessment about a verse without looking at the context that that verse comes out of, okay? Amen. And uh, my, my, you know, 
My goal is not to upset the apple cart per se and make you mad that I said the devil's not your problem. It's really just to lift a load off of you Amen. to help you see that you're you're in more you're in more control of your circumstances right. than you, than you really think you are sometimes. Second yeah. Corinthians three seven. The old covenant was transitory. That means it was a transition. It was fading. Uh, but the new covenant is not transitory. It remains. It will remain. 2 Corinthians 3 and 8 says that the old one came with glory, but that glory was fading. The new one comes with even more glory. Verse 9 says that, that it's it was glorious, the old covenant, but condemning. It was glorious, but condemning. Uh, the, the new covenant is even more glorious, but it doesn't bring condemnation. It brings righteousness, and righteousness is a gift. Amen. Amen. It is a gift. 2 Corinthians 3.10, the next verse, was glorious, but in comparison to the new, it has no glory. But the new one, rather, has surpassing glory. Or your translation might say exceeding glory. Verse 11, the transitory had glory, has much more glory, though, in the new, and it's not transitory. So just every verse there is paralleling. It is painting a picture so that you can see the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, okay? Um, it should go without saying, but I'll say it every time because there are different people sitting here every time you teach on a particular subject. I'm not saying we don't need the Old Testament in our Bibles. That's something I've been accused of saying before by somebody who only watched three minutes of a video <laughs> online one day. I'm not saying that we listen to Paul's writings and not Jesus' writings. Someone else said that one time. Uh, I'm not saying any of that, okay? So I don't like it when people cherry pick me and quote me, but there's really nothing I can do about it. But what I can control is making sure we don't cherry pick the Bible and take little things out without studying the context, okay? And especially without using Jesus as the proper hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is just a Bible school word. It, it means it's a filter, a method of study, okay? So our method of interpretation should be Christ as the method that everything comes through. Amen. All right? So in summary, the new covenant is written on the heart. It brings life, not death. It brings righteousness, not condemnation. It has surpassing glory, and it lasts, not fades away. Amen? Amen. All right, so second, with all of that in mind, 2 Corinthians 3.13 says that Moses veiled his fading glory. He veiled it, okay? Whereas we have hope, and we're bold because there is no veil. Uh, verses 14 through 16, there are several rep repetitive statements here that the Apostle Paul uses he says, uh, for to this day, even to this day, when the old covenant is read, when Moses is read, the same veil remains. A veil covers their heart. Their minds were made hard. The word hard there is the same word for petrified stone when you look at it, okay? Uh, it says a veil covers their heart. Only in Christ is the veil taken away. Then he reiterates later, when anyone turns to the Lord, it's taken away. So a veil blocks glory, but in Christ, the blockage of glory is removed. Amen. It is removed, okay? So in the first century, a veil covered their hearts. Even in the first century, I should say, Moses veiled his face. First century believers that were reading Moses were not, if they weren't reading it through the lens of Christ, then there was a veil that lied over their heart. If they were still looking for a Messiah rather than seeing the one that came and died and was buried and was resurrected, then the veil of Moses would still, that same veil remained over their hearts. So facing Moses caused a veil over the heart, but turning your face to Christ, the veil was removed. And when you turn your face to Christ, then you are beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. What you behold, you become. As you behold him, and it's a process, but as you behold him, there was a seed deposited on the inside of you when you were born again. You were born again by the incorruptible seed of God's word. How many of you know a seed starts small and it grows and becomes something? Amen. So that seed that is on the inside of you, the way to nurture that and develop that and cause it to grow is to hear the message pertaining to Christ. When you're hearing good news then that thing on the inside of you grows. It grows and it develops and it begins to move in your life and expand from the inside out. But if you're not hearing good news, if you're still hearing Moses, if you're still hearing a mixed gospel, if you're hearing people preach, yeah, Jesus came and he died for our sins and that's wonderful, but you still have to keep every, every commandment in the Bible. 
that's called mixture. That's putting people under two covenants, okay? And we don't have to live our lives now. And listen carefully to what I'm saying. Now, what a statement like this does is exposes what's in your heart. We don't have to live our lives by rules anymore. Amen. We don't govern our lives through legislation or through paper, through ink that is written on paper, because I have a greater law at work in my members and in my life, Amen. and it's the law of love. Amen. I don't have to keep in my bedroom the law and the legislation that tells me I can't hit my wife. Amen. I've never even seen it. I, I'm sure it's on the book somewhere. But I don't know anything about any laws pertaining to child abuse. Amen. Why? Because I love my children too much to ever abuse them. Amen. I love my wife too much to ever hurt her. So Amen. I don't need that legislation in me. Legislation is for lawbreakers. Amen. Laws are for lawbreakers. They're not for those who are being governed by a higher power. Amen. The thing that scares people is when you preach that way, people think you're telling them you can go out and live a lawless life. But we're not lawless, it's just that we're under a government now that is governing us from the inside out. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I have more faith in the Holy Spirit's ability to produce a holy life out of me than any legislation yes. right. written in the Old Covenant or written in Washington, D.C. Amen. 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 I trust the Holy Spirit. I have God living on the inside of me, and I don't get Him in increments. Amen? Amen. Reinhard Bonnke said this. Uh, Bishop Tony said that Reinhardt and him had breakfast. And Reinhardt said one of the things that I think the American church has misunderstood, the most common misunderstanding they have is they think the Holy Spirit comes in percentages. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, but the Holy Spirit is a person, not a commodity. Amen. You either have him or you don't have him. Amen. And if you have him, begin to live like you have him. Amen. Amen. Begin to act like you have him, talk like you have him, and live like you have him. You don't have a percentage of God in you. You are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost in your spirit. Amen? Amen. Okay, 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit is, there is freedom. So the new covenant brings us freedom. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has made us free. Amen. Freedom is scary to people that have lived under a heavy hand of law, though. Oh, yeah. Freedom is scary. And i got a good friend named Lynn Hiles who preaches about freedom and how people are terrified of it. He said what grace really does and what that type of freedom really does, it exposes what's in your heart. Amen. So if someone comes to Christ, turns through their life to Christ, and then they hear grace and they hear how loved they are unconditionally, how free they are, the, if they go out and begin to do all kinds of stuff, that's because that was in their heart all along. Man. He said, but they will come back around yes, because none of that will satisfy now. Amen. They will come back around. But he said, if you, he said, all grace does is just expose what someone already has in their heart. Right. But what is in the heart cannot be healed until it's exposed. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. So I don't freak out when I, when I see people go and live any old way they want to live. I just keep preaching to them who they are in Christ. Amen. Eventually they're going to believe it and they're going to stop acting that way. Amen. Okay. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Moses wore a veil over his face, whereas we reflect, we reflect with an unveiled face. And we'll get into that a little bit more Sunday morning. Moses had a decreasing glory. We have an ever-increasing glory. So in summary there, Moses had a decreasing, fading glory. He wore a veil to cover the fading glory. In Christ, however, we have an ever-increasing glory and no veil over our face, and we reflect his glory. Amen. Okay? Amen. So, and here's some bonus points for you. The word veiled in 2 Corinthians 3, 13, and 18 is the Greek word kalupto. In Revelation chapter 1 and 1, verse 1, it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the word revelation, there is apokalupto, okay? It means unveiling. So kalupto means veiled. Apokalupto means unveil, okay? To lift the veil. The only place in the New Testament which mentions kalupto, only place in the entire New Testament that where the Greek word kalupto is, which means veiled, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So we know as a fact that the only New Testament veil was the Old Covenant. It's the only reference to it whatsoever. So with that in mind, when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says the New Covenant has brought us life. Righteousness, increasing glory, freedom, an unveiled face so that we can boldly reflect his glory. 
is remove the veil from our hearts and our minds, the natural conclusion from all of that is that we set our old ways aside. And we begin to live the life of Christ. The new covenant affects our personal life. It affects our practical life. Because the tablets of stone in the old covenant told us what to do. But the new covenant tells us who we are. Yes. Amen. It tells us who we are, okay? And that changes us so that we naturally, naturally, from our new nature, okay, begin to do the right thing. Because right living flows from right thinking or right believing, okay? Verse 3 in 2 Corinthians 4, I'm just going verse by verse. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to them that are perishing, the gospel isn't supposed to be veiled, okay, because it is, it's glory being reflected from unveiled faces. But if it's veiled, it's veiled to them that are perishing. The God of this age, let's look at some words here. The, the, it's the Greek word eon in this text. There are two Greek words for age in the New Covenant. There's the word cosmos, which means the world, and there's the word eon, which means age, okay? Is everybody doing all right tonight? Yeah. Yeah. The God of this age, this eon, has blinded the mind, it's the Greek word noma, of the unbeliever. So I want you to notice that Paul writes this age, so he was speaking in a present tense in that chapter. Okay, he's speaking in a present tense. At that time, let me give you a little bit of backdrop in history, the end of two ages was fast approaching. The end of the old covenant age was, was nearing, it was fast approaching, was coming in 70 A.D., when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem in 70 A.D., that was the coming to a close, that was the finality of the Old Covenant, okay? And simultaneously, the end of the Age of Ares was also, uh, the Ares was the age of the ram, the age of the temple sacrifice system, and it was transitioning out as well. You say, well, isn't that astrology? No, that's astronomy. It's Hebrew cosmology is what it is, and there's a difference between that and Babylonian astrology. Astrology, you don't have any place for that in your life. It's not going to do you any good, okay? And I wouldn't invite, I wouldn't tempt fate and invite any demons that might be attached to that into my life, so I would ignore horoscopes and astrology and things like that. Amen. But Hebrew cosmology is a whole different thing. They followed the stars. They charted them. They believed in the ages. They marked the ages. It's all through the Bible. From cover to cover, it talks about the ages, and they charted the ages, and they watched them, okay? So at that time, they were in the age of Aries, which was the time, which was the age of a ram that began around the time when the ram was caught in the thickets, okay? And Abraham took the ram out, uh, and, it, and it went all the way up until Jesus came on the scene, and the age of Pisces was transitioning in. The overlapping of those two ages created a transition period because in it, you can't just see the beginning of an age or the end of an age because you're talking about stars that are going way, way out, you know, light, light, thousands and thousands of light years out. So it might be a 40 to 70 year, maybe even a 100 or 200 year transition, but if one begins to fade off the scene and another one begins to come on the scene. Pisces was the age of the fish, and that's the one that was transitioning in during the time of Jesus. And the beginning of Pisces was marked with the miracle that Jesus performed when he called the disciples. And he comes to them, and he calls the disciples, and he tells them to cast the net over, and they, pull, they catch so many fish. So there's a miracle involving fish that's marking the beginning of that age, okay? So Paul uses the same Greek word for age, eon. That's the word that he uses. So the, what was the God which had blinded the mind, the pneuma of the believers? First of all, let me show you that the word God in that text is the Greek word theos. Now when you look, now theos is the word for God, period. But when you look at, at the definition in a Greek dictionary, there is God or a God. God is in capital letters, and in that case, Theos is in capital letters. But then there is a God, and it's in small letters, and Theos will also be in small letters. The small letters are what is in this translation right here, okay? It's not talking about God himself, but it's talking about a God, okay? Meaning a governing force. Yes. If you remember, Jesus even called us gods when he quoted, he said, does not your own... Does not your own uh, system call you gods? Did not your own teacher say we are gods? 
You know, Benny Hinn got in a lot of trouble for teaching that, that we were gods uh, at one time. But he wasn't too far off. Just a lot of people weren't ready to hear that. We were created just under the Godhead itself, okay? Amen. So we've been given dominion. <laughs> so what Paul, what was the God that he was talking about? Well, Paul refers back to 2 Corinthians 3.14. He says, but their minds were hardened for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. So he ties chapter 4 in with chapter 3. So before we make that small jump to understand what he's saying, let me show you one more place that he talked about this situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm, I'm wrapping up here uh, just real quick. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 6. Take you to his first, Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians. I want to show you where he used similar language and he quoted Isaiah. In uh, verse 6 it says, Yet among the mature... We do impart wisdom, although it is not the wisdom of this age. It's a Greek word eon there. Greek word eon, okay? Who are doomed to pass away. When did they pass away? 70 AD. Okay? No, we declare God's wisdom. A mystery that has been hidden, apocrypto, and that God has destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age, eon, understood it. Okay? For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, and he's quoting Isaiah 64, 4 here, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed, apocalypto, to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So Paul doesn't say the word veiled there, but he uses a similar word in describing this. And he speaks of the temple leaders as the rulers of that age. The temple rulers, how, where does he speak of? Because he says if the temple rulers had wisdom and understanding, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. Man. Okay? The temple rulers lacked that though, okay? <clears throat> so uh, Isaiah says, the, the reference he's quoting from, for from of old no one has heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you, who works and shows himself active on behalf of him who waits for him. Okay, so then he goes on and says that the Spirit has unveiled the deep things of God. The Spirit has unveiled the deep things of God. So in summary, 1 Corinthians 2, the temple rulers of the old covenant age were blinded and they were unable to understand the gospel. So they crucified the Lord. Yeah. What were they blinded by? The veil. Yeah. They were bl blinded by the veil over them when they read Moses. It prevented them from seeing the Messiah. Okay? So the believer, though, has had the new covenant unveiled to all of us. All of them and all of us has had the new covenant unveiled. So we do have the ability. We have the ability for our minds to conceive the will of God and the purpose of God for our life and to fathom the riches of Christ, Amen. to understand and to access what our inheritance is in Him. You have the ability to. Amen. You might say, no, Pastor Mark, I'm like lost right now. I haven't got a word you said tonight. Uh, well, let me tell you what the trick to that is. Keep hearing it over and over again. Amen. Spiritual hearing is something that is developed. Right. So if what seemingly will go over your head, you know the first time I started listening to Miles Monroe and Tudor Bismarck and different guys like that, it did sound Greek to me, literally. Uh, you know, I was 18 years old, and I grew up just listening to plain Jane Pentecostal preachers. I love them. They loved me, but they didn't have any degrees at all, okay? And so they, there was no Bible school there. They just thought all you needed was the anointing, and that was it. And so I grew up listening to uh, preachers that weren't that educated and didn't have that much uh, you know, depth of understanding, and now all of a sudden I started exposing myself, going to conferences and hearing the Miles Monroes of the world, and the Tudor Bismarcks, and, and even in that day, Bishop T.D. Jakes a little bit as well, and different ones, and I, you know, I would have to write stuff down and go home and look up what it meant, because I, it was over my head. How did I grow into that? I kept listening. Something on the inside of me recognized the anointing, even though my, my understanding wasn't pulling it all in. I felt the anointing, and it made the baby kick on the inside of me. Something in my spirit leaped 
whenever I heard that. So I was drawn to it, so I just kept listening to it, and I began to develop an ear to hear it now. You know, and it gets to the point, and this is not about me, I'm just talking about spiritual hearing. It gets to the point where you sit now in services, and I know what somebody's about to say before they say it, because I have got my spiritual hearing to where I can catch up now. And I can listen and I know where they're going. They can read a verse and start saying a sentence. And I'm already typing it out in my notes because my hearing has finally caught up to that. So it develops, okay? So be encouraged tonight. Be encouraged. So uh, Paul picks that same theme up there in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, ch chapter 3 and chapter 4. And he says the temple rulers were blinded by their God. He also writes about their God. The, this time he writes about their God, in, in fact, in chapter 4, which was, the God was the Old Covenant itself. Their God that is referenced in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it says the God of this age is not Satan. It is the Old Covenant. Okay? And when you understand that, you'll begin to understand. So am, am I certain of that? Well, man, I just went through 50 verses with you. And I just paralleled every one of them side by side to show it to you in its context that Satan is not the God of anything right now. Okay, he has been stripped and disarmed. Colossians said that Jesus publicly stripped him and disarmed him and made an open show of him, an open spectacle. Amen? So that means he mocked him in it. So he's not our problem. Amen? The only problem that we have... And the greatest warfare that we fight, by the way, a lot of people say, yeah, but he's still fighting, he's still holding on. Only in your mind, man. Mm -hmm. Only between the greatest battle that we face is the one that takes place between our ears. It's just the battle to stay convinced of our righteousness, peace, and joy. Amen. Amen? Those, are, those are kingdom positions that we have in Christ. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. It's in the Holy Ghost. So the greatest battle we face is to stay convinced of our righteousness our peace, and our joy. So that's the spiritual warfare that takes place in our life is when, when deceiving thoughts try to come in and say, if, you'd have, if, if you were really saved, you wouldn't have done that. Yeah. That's the thoughts that you cast down. Right. You cast those thoughts down and you bring into captivity every thought, not to your disobedience, but to the obedience of Christ. Yeah. So it's by meditating on his obedience that you bring yours under subjection. That's how you deal with it, amen? amen. And so it's the spiritual warfare verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, they don't really, all, all the way through there, the language, the verbiage gives away that it's not a physical warfare that we're fighting, but it's thoughts, it's principles, it's mindsets, it's understandings, it's imaginations. You see, it, what, what do all those things have in common? They all are up here. It's reasonings, reasonings, <laughs> imaginations, thoughts, bringing thoughts into captivity. He's talking about something that's happening in your mind. Why? Because that's where man fell. Man fell in the mind. Adam fell in the mind, but Christ came and restored everything. The last Adam restored everything. The first Adam lost. So now we're in Christ. What we have to do, the work that he did for us is finished. The work he's doing in us and through us is ongoing. So what we have to do now is meditate on his finished work, meditate on who he says we are, on who he is in us and who we are in him, and it changes your thoughts. It changes your mind, and victory will start oozing out of you. You'll start just automatically shaking things off. So it's not about heavy-handed discipline. That's not, that's, not the, that's not really the key to getting set free from stuff. Because you can tighten the reins on your life, and you can bring a heavy hand of discipline in, but you're not changing your heart when you do that. Amen? I mean, you're not. You're not addressing the heart. You're just addressing the behavior. That's like saying, I don't want lemons to grow on that tree outside, so I'm going to go out there and climb it and cut every lemon off that grows on it. All you're going to do is keep cutting the lemons off. You're never going to change the nature of that tree. Lemons will keep coming back. What needs to happen in your life is not the cutting away of things per se, but it's, it's, it's the, the DNA shift you need to be aware of, that you're in Christ and his DNA is in you, and you need to meditate on the last Adam, not the first one, okay? He's dead, and you don't have to crucify your flesh every day either. That's another misconception that we can deal with. 
when Paul said, I die daily, he wasn't establishing a doctrine. He's, he was saying in the original language, I face death every day. The Jews are so mad over me teaching Christ that as I travel from synagogue to synagogue, they are literally trying to kill me daily. They, and they tried. They stoned him. They beat him. They imprisoned him. You know, all of that stuff. So that's what that's talking about, okay? So Paul's not talking about in Satan. It's much more plausible that he's talking about the rulers of the Old Covenant age. They were the temple rulers. Their God was the Old Covenant itself. And when you study back into the typology and the symbolism used in the culture of the day, you'll really get a better picture. The sun, the moon, and the stars falling from the sky. The sun turned to moon, uh, turned to darkness. The blood turning to moon. The stars falling from the sky. All of that wasn't a literal reference to the heavens that we see. But in Hebrew culture, the vernacular, that language, they knew that that language was a reference to the, the government of the Mosaic Temple. The, Jew, the Jewish temple that was in place, the rulers, the leaders, all of that language represented the rulers and the leaders and the government and all of that stuff falling from power. It's, it's just, you can study it and you can find that. And remember Joseph's dream that he had? He said, I had a dream that the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowed to me. Well, he, he wasn't talking about the constellations and the, and the planets and stuff. His father immediately said, what makes you think your father and your mother and your brothers are going to bow to you? So in that culture, Jacob knew exactly what his son was talking about. He was talking about the rulership of the household. Okay, what I just wanted to do tonight, I'm going to get into reflecting glory a little bit Sunday morning, is then I'm going to be gone for a couple of services, uh, but I wanted to set some foundation to help you that un understand why we preach the way that we preach here, why we call ourselves a new covenant church, why we believe the veil is gone from this place, amen, this is a place where you can come in and see Christ unveiled, and you can begin, if you're willing, you can begin to turn to him and step out of legalism, the bondage of legalism, and into the freedom that we have in Christ. And that freedom will begin to invade every area of your life. Amen? It will invade all the other areas of your life as well. So I say this in closing. The devil is not the greatest threat that humanity faces. Religion is. Amen. Religion has always been the greatest threat and continues to remain a threat. Because people, turning to religion is not the answer. Because there's only more bondage in religion. It's turning to relationship. Relationship with Jesus Christ and, expect, and just accepting the simple freedom that we have in Him. That's what sets men and women free. That's refreshing. That's a breath of fresh air to people that have been in bondage. Amen. Let's stand up together tonight. It may have taken a few more minutes longer than normal to get that out. But I wanted to just lay some foundation.